in a world shrouded in deception, where power-hungry politicians relentlessly plot their rise, and pharmaceutical titans chase the ever-elusive dollar, the COVID-19 pandemic became the perilous crossroads where these sinister forces converged. They used to bury 25 people a week here. In the age of the coronavirus, it's about that number every day. New allegations this morning from an unnamed CIA whistleblower relating to the origins of COVID-19. A senior level officer claiming the agency offered hush money to analysts to cover up their findings that COVID-19 likely originated in a Wuhan, China lab. 2.8% of the 777, that is one in 35, one in 35 had vaccine-associated myocardial injury. The UN started telling us about 12 years ago that there'll be a disease X that'll be used to bring in planetary control, a world government, a UN treaty that takes over all your local medical care, and that creates a medical worldwide ID, a vaccine passport that's used as a platform for a global social credit score, a central bank digital currency, a programmable digital uh, token ESG system. Over the period of time from 2010 to 2016, 27,000 royalty payments were paid to 1,800 NIH employees. We know that not because you told us, but because we forced you to tell us through the Freedom of Information Act. This narrative that there's only one way to deal with this and that this way is actually going to stop it. Well, if it is going to stop it, why do you care who gets it? You should just get it. Because if you get it, that means that no one else is going to You're never going to get it. Everybody who gets the shot is never going to get it. That was the narrative. That was a lie from the beginning. And now we're realizing that it was a lie. Everybody realized it was a lie. Was the Pfizer COVID vaccine tested on stopping the transmission of the virus before it entered the market? Um, regarding the question around, um, did we know about stopping humanization before um, it entered the market? No. Prepare yourself for a journey that might seem torn from the pages of a dystopian sci-fi thriller. Yet I assure you, this is the chilling reality we face. The mission? To unmask the truth concealed amongst a cacophony of deception. We will navigate through the intricate labyrinth of falsehoods and misinformation. Guided by the unwavering testimonies of first-hand accounts, confidential leaks, meticulous medical studies, and more. You're about to see the truth they've been hiding for years. I remember when I first heard the term coronavirus and literally thought the girl saying it was making a joke as she drank too much corona the night before and was just hung over. It was only a few days later that I realized what she was actually talking about. I would have never imagined that an illness from China would bring the entire world to a complete standstill. We have a new name for the coronavirus. The World Health Organization has officially called it COVID-19, Co for Corona, Vi for Virus, D for Disease, and 19 because it started last year. Breaking news, the first death from coronavirus here in the United States. Avoid gathering in groups of more than 10 people, avoid discretionary travel, and avoid eating and drinking at bars, restaurants, and public food courts. But to tell the full story of the COVID vaccine, we have to start from the beginning with patient zero the early days of COVID. There's been some questions surrounding just who patient zero actually is. If you do a simple Google search for COVID-19 patient zero, you'll find hundreds of articles claiming they found patient zero. It's almost like those advertisements you see everywhere. This vegetable burns belly fat overnight. People may have fallen for that at first, but they've grown wise to the clickbait tactics and simply roll their eyes the next time they see it. Here's what we know about the early cases of COVID-19. The WHO published an alert on January 5th, 2020. In the memo, it describes some of the earliest reports of what was only categorized as some sort of pneumonia. Title, quote, pneumonia of unknown cause, China, end quote. It states that the first cases of the unknown pneumonia were reported by the WHO China office on December 31st of 2019. Quote, on 31st December 2019, the Hu China country office was informed of cases of pneumonia of unknown etiology detected in Wuhan City, Hubei province of China, end quote. 
On January 3rd, 2020, a total of 44 patients in China were reported to have this pneumonia of unknown origins. Quote, of the 44 cases reported, 11 are severely ill, while the remaining 33 patients are in stable condition, end quote. Early reports were that the outbreak occurred at the Huanan Seafood Market in Wuhan, China. Quote, according to the authorities, some patients were operating dealers or vendors in the Huanan Seafood Market. Based on the preliminary information from the Chinese investigation team, no evidence of significant human-to-human -human transmission and no healthcare worker infections have been reported, end quote. However, other sources such as the South China Morning Post have reported that the first case of the novel coronavirus actually occurred on November 17th of 2019. Quote, the first case of someone in China suffering from COVID-19, the disease caused by the novel coronavirus, can be traced back to November 17th, according to the government data seen by the South China Morning Post, end quote. The issue with pinning down the real patient zero of COVID-19 is that early on when patients were coming in with the illness, they were being categorized as having pneumonia-like symptoms. There's no telling how many people around the world had the coronavirus with no serious symptoms, didn't see a doctor, and brushed it off as a common cold. But the common consensus is that the virus did start to spread in late 2019, hence the 19 in COVID-19. Origins Senate Republicans released a 300-page report on the origins of COVID-19 titled Muddy Waters, which is fitting due to how muddy the reporting is coming out of China. Ultimately, it comes down to two possibilities. The first being zoonotic, an infection or disease that is transmissible from animals to humans under natural conditions. Or two, research-related lab leak. Gain-of-function research on a virus to better understand its inner workings to, in theory, stop the spread and learning how to keep the public safe in case of an outbreak. The zoonotic theory was all over the early reports in the media. I'm sure you saw the video of the infamous China wet markets. The very popular markets all over China that sells everything from snakes, raccoon dogs, clams, and of course, bats. According to the AP, bats are known to carry coronavirus and in fact, the closest relative of the virus that causes COVID-19 has been found in bats. So the zoonotic theory is that the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 was caused at the Huanan seafood market when patrons would purchase the bats to make bat soup. I know it sounds nasty, but it's actually a delicacy in some cultures and has been for many years. However, investigators went to the wet market and tested the animals there. They found none of them tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. So if it was a zoonotic event, how could none of the animals at the wet market test positive? The report goes on to say, it would be expected that environmental samples collected from wet markets that were positive for SARS-CoV-2 would likely show evidence of animal genetic adaptation. A study authored by the former director of China's CDC, George Fugao, analyzed 1,380 samples collected from the environment, 923, and animals, 457, within the Huanan seafood market in early 2020. His study identified 73 SARS-CoV-2 positive environmental samples. Three live viruses were successfully isolated from these environmental samples. None of the samples taken from the 18 animal species found in the market were positive for SARS-CoV-2, end quote. It further stated, quote, a number of epidemiologists, virologists, and at first, the Chinese government have asserted that the COVID-19 pandemic originated from a natural zoonotic spillover occurring at the Hunan seafood market in mid to late December 2019. They declared that this was the origin of the pandemic. China government officials have subsequently asserted that SARS-CoV-2 was imported on the surface of frozen seafood by infected people or animals or originated from a U.S military laboratory. Support for these alternative theories is limited to the government-controlled publications in China and are not credible. The limited epidemiological data provided by PRC officials continues to hamstring efforts to better understand the early trajectory of the virus. PRC officials continue to suppress and manipulate COVID-19 data." End quote. So to simplify that for you, 
we cannot give any legitimate weight to basically any data that was given to the US government by China. Which again is why the origins are so hard to pin down, unlike many other viruses where we can track where it started. For a communist country like China, who many view as our biggest enemy, to clearly give us bogus data about a massive virus that has originated from their country should really send everyone's red flags up. Now for the second option and the most likely cause of the outbreak, a lab leak. According to the Muddy Waters report, the safety equipment training and personnel of the Wuhan Institute of Virology (WIV) was vastly underwhelming. Quote, China lagged behind in biosafety concepts, relevant standards, practices for high contamination laboratories and research and development of biosafety equipment. And as a consequence, China could only domestically produce a portion of biosafety equipment needed and were dependent on foreign sources. Despite China's scarce attempt to bolster its safety protocols after the 2003 SARS outbreak, many see that, quote, its capacity for innovation remained weak, end quote. And quote, China still faced many laboratory biosafety challenges that was subject to both international and national concern, end quote. Many scientists across the globe voiced their concerns over the WIV doing dangerous research into viral infections. Quote, some Western scientists called into question whether the potential benefits to be gained from the WIV's coronavirus research involving the genetic manipulation and creation of chimeric viruses was worth the considerable risk to the public, end quote. In 2019, the same year of the coronavirus outbreak, the WIV applied for several patents to approve the overall safety and security in the facility. Quote, that same month, the WIV submitted 13 of 17 total patents submitted in 2019 for biosafety related improvements. The applications covered a range of remedial actions for physical containment, hermetically sealed doors, wastewater treatment, decontamination, autoclaves, and chemicals showers and maintaining negative air pressure in the high contaminant laboratories, exhaust air management. The number of patents by itself is not unusual. High contaminant laboratories constantly seek to improve through innovation the biosafety posture of their facility. The nature of the issues and problems the WIV was remediating is revealing to their state of biosafety at the time. End quote. Quote, one patent addressed the problem of maintaining airtight seals on the gas tight doors and cites the potential problem of existing door seals that develop slow leaks over time. Another patent addressed developing a manually operated auxiliary exhaust fan to maintain negative pressure and improve disinfection of biosecurity laboratories HEPA filters. Another described improving the design and operation of the biosafety autoclave sterilizers. This patent described problems of being unable to achieve required sterilization temperatures, potential leaks around the autoclave doors, and excessive contamination of autoclave infectious materials, end quote. But the evidence that this was a lab leak continued to pile up. Despite these alarming lab conditions, the WIV ramped up their coronavirus research. Quote, despite these apparent Apparent biosafety challenges, the WIV's research continued a pace to identify potential human pandemic causing SARS related coronavirus and medical countermeasures to mitigate them. In pursuit of this task, researchers collect hundreds of SARS related bat coronaviruses from across China and Southeast Asia. The risk of research related incidents begins with field expeditions where researchers first collect bat samples. The WIV and other Wuhan Institute, CCDC, researchers operated in a challenging setting with limited light and sometimes only with partial personal protective equipment and exposed skin. It also placed researchers at considerable risk for potential bites, scratches, and needle stick injuries while collecting field samples from bats, end quote. It was determined that in 2019, the WIV collected upwards of 20,000 bat and other animal virus samples from around China. Most of the time, the samples were collected by poorly trained volunteers and even grad graduate students. Well, here's something spicy. New bombshell whistleblower revelations on the origins of COVID-19 have come in, and it is not looking good for the natural origins crowd. New reporting alleges that the CIA offered to pay off analysts in hopes of burying their findings that COVID-19 was likely leaked from a lab. 
Wow. Tuesday, the House Coronavirus Subcommittee and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence notified the CIA Director William Burns of these startling allegations. According to a high-level CIA officer, six officers of the CIA were given a, quote, significant monetary incentive to change their position on the origins of the virus. With all of these facts revealed, I believe it's clear that the pandemic started due to a lab leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. However, the questions surrounding the origins of the pandemic will always remain a mystery due to China's nature of saving face to the rest of the world and their willingness to censor and even manipulate the truth. The race for a vaccine. The year of 2020 was completely overtaken by the spread of COVID-19. Then 2021 was dominated by Big Pharma racing to get a vaccine to the market. Before we get into how the COVID-19 vaccine was developed, I want to discuss a few things first. One, what exactly is a vaccine in layman's terms? A vaccine is usually a mixture of bacteria and elements of the virus you're being vaccinated for. However, the virus particles you're being injected with are weakened or killed to just mimic the illness, which in theory will trigger the body's immune system to produce antibodies. In the most simplest of terms possible, you get a non-toxic amount of the virus which tricks your immune system into fighting off the illness. So when you get the actual virus, your body already has a defense system to protect you. Vaccines are typically administered by injection. 2. What does mRNA mean? The mRNA vaccine is made using mRNA that gives your cells instructions for how to make the spike protein found on the surface of the COVID-19 virus. After vaccination, your immune system begins making the spike protein and displaying them on cell surfaces. 3. How was the vaccine developed? There are five stages of developing a vaccine, and those stages typically take upwards of 10 years. 1. Discovery research, 2 to 5 years. In this early stage of vaccine development, researchers explore their idea for a potential vaccine. Vaccine development often takes 10 to 15 years of laboratory research, usually in a company in private industry, but often involves collaboration with researchers at a university. 2. Proof of concept, 2 years. Before a vaccine can be tested in people, researchers study its ability to cause an immune response with small animals like mice. At this stage, researchers may make adjustments to the vaccine to make it more effective. Vaccine effectiveness is important because it measures how well vaccination protects people against outcomes such as infection, symptomatic illness, hospitalization, and death. If the vaccine shows promising enough results, it moves forward to clinical trials for testing in people. 3. Testing the vaccine, 1 to 2 years. Next, the vaccine enters a clinical development stage, which is also called a clinical trial. To do this, researchers submit an investigational new drug, IND, application to the FDA, which includes data from animal studies, information on manufacturing technology, and the quality of the vaccine. Vaccine quality is important because it affects how well it will work to provide long and short-term protection against disease. The clinical development stage is a three-phase process, which may include a fourth phase if the vaccine is approved by the FDA. So there you have it, the full breakdown on what all goes into making a vaccine. Again, it takes, on average, 10 years from start to finish. So I have a Democrat friend who's very smart. Hopefully he votes for me, but he's very smart. He said, I don't understand one thing about you. I watch your rallies. They're incredible. You talk about beating ISIS. You talk about taxes. You talk about uh, regulation. You talk about everything. But you never saw said that I've never heard you talk about how the incredible job you did with the vaccines, because, as you know, I got them done in nine months and it was supposed to take anywhere from five to 12 years. I broke their ass. OK, and you know who doesn't like me too much? The FDA because they were very bureaucratic and I got it done. Let's take a look at some of the other vaccines throughout history and how long they took to develop. Influenza. For example, the 1918 influenza pandemic infected an estimated 500 million people worldwide and left 675,000 people dead in the United States, according to the CDC. But it wasn't until 1945 three decades later that the first flu vaccine was licensed for civilian use in the United States. Hepatitis B. 
Hepatitis B is a more recent virus and was discovered by Dr. Barrett Blumberg in 1965. Just four years later, he created the hepatitis B vaccine using a heat-treated form of the virus. Twelve years later, in 1981, the FDA approved the first commercially available hepatitis B vaccination, which involved blood samples from infected donors. Human papillomavirus Two strains of HPV are thought to cause up to 70% of cervical cancer, which can result in hundreds of thousands of deaths each year. The link between HPV and cervical cancer was first made in 1981, and over two decades of research followed before a viable vaccine hit the market. Many times over the years, vaccines were created, used, then re-engineered to make it safer and more effective. But our government would never administer a vaccine unless it's totally and completely safe, right? Well, unfortunately, that is not the case. Throughout history, there's been numerous times where vaccines were developed, manufactured, and administered to hundreds of thousands of individuals that were told they would be protected against a certain illness, just for that vaccine to make them seriously ill or even die. One such case is known as the Cutter Incident. Before a safe and effective polio vaccine was created by Jonas Salk in 1955, and a variation by Albert Sabin in 1961, the polio virus was the most feared illness in history. A poll found that second to only the atomic bomb, polio was what Americans feared most. Fearful of the spread of the contagious virus, the city closed pools, swimming holes, movie theaters, schools, and churches, forcing priests to reach out to their congregation on local radio. Some motorists who had to stop for gas in San Angelo would not fill up their deflated tires, afraid they'd bring home air containing the infectious virus. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, it should. The similarities between COVID-19 and the polio virus are quite astounding. At its peak in the 1940s and 1950s, polio would paralyze or kill half a million people worldwide every year. 6,891,469 people have died so far from the coronavirus. Both viruses are highly contagious and can be spread through droplets via a sneeze or a cough. Even individuals who are showing no signs may unknowingly have the virus and spread it. The country was in a panic, letting the virus completely control their lives, avoiding contact with one another and businesses closing, the race for a vaccine was on. Cutter Laboratories, a family pharmaceutical company located in California, was founded by Edward Ahern Cutter in 1897 and has done work for the federal government in the past during World War II. So it was no surprise when they were one of the first companies awarded a license by the U.S. government to produce the polio vaccine in 1955. Despite being inspected and said to be safe, 120,000 vaccine vials contained live polio virus elements. Due to children being the most vulnerable to the polio virus, these vaccines were administered to children. 40,000 of those children developed abortive poliomyelitis, which is basically a less severe version of the polio virus. However, symptoms do include a low-grade fever, fatigue, sore throat, headaches, among others, and typically go away in about a week. 56 of those children developed paralytic poliomyelitis, paralysis. Then, to make matters worse, because these children were given the polio virus from the vaccine, they then spread the virus to members of their family and communities, this resulting in 113 people becoming paralyzed and five dying. In 1954, the National Institute of Health, NIH, assigned Dr. Bernice E. Eddy to oversee the vaccine production and assure that the polio vaccine was safe at Cutter Labs. The way this was done was testing the vaccine on monkeys. When Eddy tested the vaccine from Cutter Labs on 18 monkeys, it was discovered that a number of batches of the polio vaccine paralyzed those monkeys. Eddy reported her findings to her supervisor, William Workman. Workman not only completely ignored and waved off Eddie's horrific findings, he relieved her from duty. As a result of this, Cutter Laboratories was found not to be liable, despite the vaccine being produced and manufactured by them. However, Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare Ovita Kolpabi stepped down. Dr. William H. Sebrell Jr., the director of NIH, resigned. Unfortunately, 
The irresponsible rush to produce a vaccine is yet another identical similarity between the polio virus and COVID-19. Trust the science. Something we heard throughout the pandemic, and even to this day, is trust the science. I trust the scientists. Trust the science. Ah! Trust the science! Trust the science! (laughs) But whose science should we be trusting? Because there's two sides to every story, as they say. On one side, you have someone like Dr. Anthony Fauci, who has been caught lying to Congress about the origins of COVID-19. As we covered already, the evidence points to a lab leak as the cause of the COVID-19 outbreak. In May of 2021, Senator Rand Paul pressed Dr. Fauci during a congressional hearing on the origins of COVID-19 about the NIH's funding of -of gain-of-function research. Dr. Fauci denied that the NIH ever funded GOF research. Dr. Fauci... We don't know whether the pandemic started in a lab in Wuhan or evolved naturally, but we should want to know. Instead, government authorities, self-interested in continuing gain-of-function research, say there's nothing to see here. Dr. Fauci, do you still support funding of the NIH funding of the lab in Wuhan? Senator Paul, with all due respect, you are entirely and completely incorrect that the NIH has not ever and does not now fund gain of function research. However, The Intercept, a news organization, sued the National Institute of Health, NIH, in late 2021. What was uncovered was a massive document dump that revealed the NIH did in fact fund GOF research. Documents obtained by The Intercept contain new evidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the nearby Wuhan University Center for Animal Experiment, along with their collaborator, the U.S.-based nonprofit EcoHealth Alliance, have engaged in what the U.S. government defines as gain-of-function research of concern, intentionally making viruses more pathogenic or transmissible in order to study them. Despite stipulations for from a U.S. funding agency that the money not be used for that purpose. Grant money for the controversial experiment came from the National Institute of Health's National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is headed by Anthony Fauci, a research organization which studies the spread of viruses from animals to humans, included subawards to Wuhan Institute of Virology and East China Normal University. The principal investigator on the grant is EcoHealth Alliance President Peter Daszak, who has been a key voice in the search for COVID-19's origins. Now, some say that Dr. Fauci didn't lie to Congress, that he didn't know the NIH funded gain-of-function research. However, I find that extremely hard to believe. Dr. Fauci was the director of the NIH for almost 40 years. How could he possibly not know that his organization was funding something as controversial as gain-of-function research? So he either lied to Congress, which is a felony, or he's completely incompetent. I'm not sure which is worse. The other side. The Center for Countering Digital Hate was founded in late 2018 by Imran Ahmed. On March 24, 2021, the CCDH published a 40-page document taking aim at 12 of the most outspoken people with differing opinions on the COVID vaccine. They coined these individuals the disinformation dozen. Among some of the 12 individuals are Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Aaron Elizabeth, Dr. Rashid Batar, among others. Robert Kennedy Jr. may not be a doctor, but he has been one of the top researchers in the field of vaccines for decades. Dr. Pitar was a doctor of osteopathic medicine who graduated from Des Moines University, which is the 15th largest medical school in the United States. A number of doctors have been punished by medical boards for spreading misinformation about COVID-19 and the vaccine. When they use the term misinformation, what they really mean is they have different opinions on the virus and the vaccine. When you go see a doctor about an illness or ailment, one doctor may prescribe you medication A, yet another doctor you see may prescribe you medication B. After all, that's why most patients seek a second opinion. Yet, if a doctor disagrees with the COVID-19 vaccine, they automatically get slapped with the misinformation label, risk censorship, and possibly even loss of their medical license. Dr. Michael Hong is a doctor who practiced medicine at his office in California. Dr. Hong made the news several times due to him speaking out against COVID-19, mandates, and the COVID-19 vaccine. 
Two years ago, Dr. Huang was in local news being accused of issuing fake mask exceptions to students. Quote, a group of former colleagues and concerned parents alleged Dr. Michael Huang, a private practitioner in Roseville, sold complete mask exceptions for students, including a waiver for wearing of face shields normally reserved for students who cannot wear masks. Dr. Huang was shocked when the accusations were brought to his attention. Quote, this is all new to me. We were not aware or even known that there was any accusations about my practice. Quote, if I'm the only physician writing exceptions, that means all of the other physicians in this state, in my area, in many other areas also in the state, basically gave up on their patients, Huang said. In February of this year, Dr. Huang was on Fox News where he spoke out against the COVID vaccine. How many vaccine-related injuries did you come across before the COVID shot became available? Before the pandemic, before the COVID vaccine uh, uh, vaccination program, I've seen maybe one or two adult vaccine-related injury, and they were mild. And I had to apologize on behalf of my profession. That physician has really fought on our face, and they have refused to listen to patients when they come in with vaccine injury symptoms and basically to just assume that it doesn't exist. We're ignoring, we're ignoring the real world experience of physicians on the front line treating patients. We're dismissing what they're seeing with their own eyes in favor of a medical cartel. Yes. That's how, what we call them. So doctor, sh should the government be recommending COVID shots or boosters of any kind to any American today? given the risk benefit analysis that we pretty much understand at this point? If you get sick, you don't call CDC or FDA for recommendations. If my patient gets sick in California, they don't call Dr. Gavin Newsom for uh, treatment recommendations. Government should let doctor practice medicine. So uh, what the uh, Florida's report has indicated as far as the high number of COVID vaccine injury, it's true various website for years and years has tracked vaccine injuries. On average, about 180 deaths will be contributed uh, from the vaccine yearly. That's about 10 to 12 uh, vaccine-related uh, deaths per month. The first month of COVID-19 vaccine program got started, it were over 180 deaths reported. We should have seen that clear signal that something needs to be stopped. Sadly, Dr. Huang was forced to close his medical practice because he chose to treat his patients the way he felt was best, rather than the CDC and Big Pharma way. Quote, we are sad to announce that I will be closing my medical practice on July 1st, 2023. Sutter canceled my epic electronic medical record contract combined with pressure from the state of California. Limiting physicians' ability to speak freely means that we'll have great difficulty continuing delivering safe and effective medical care in an efficient manner, end quote. Well, everybody, this used to be my office. This is what happened when you decide to speak up, speak the truth. This is what happened when I say no, I will not hurt my patient. I will do the right thing. I'll tell people that this COVID disease is easy to treat and the mask doesn't work. It's a tool to scare people. Dr. Mary Bowden is another doctor who has been fired from her hospital, censored by big tech and defamed by the media, all because she had a differing opinion on how to treat COVID-19 and how effective the vaccine is. Quote, Dr. Mary Bowden is an ear, nose, and throat specialist. She runs her own private practice, Breath MD, but has recently joined the staff at Houston Methodist. The doctor, who claims she has treated more than 2,000 patients with COVID-19, says she had a great relationship with Methodist until they disagreed with some of her social media posts regarding vaccine mandates and treatments, end quote. Medical freedom has been hijacked. It's been hijacked by hospitals. Big Pharma, insurance companies, and the federal agencies. Doctors, this is our time. We need to stand up and save our profession. And, and patients, ask yourself, do you want doctors that respect your right to informed consent and respect your right to try? Or do you want those that follow
follow the dictates of hospitals, insurance companies, and federal agencies. No. <clears throat> Media companies um, and the bullying of physicians that don't follow the narrative in hospitals and governments that are unwilling to share important data about the vaccines and about COVID treatments have bred mistrust amongst the public. Yes. Who do you think would know how to treat a patient's condition better? The doctor who has established a relationship with the patient on a one-on-one -on -one basis or the CDC and Big Pharma? Masks. Masks have been a hot topic of debate ever since the first report of the coronavirus in 2020. Basically, every building that was ran by the government required you to wear a mask or you couldn't enter. Even in late 2023, you still see a small number of people wearing a mask, sadly, even outdoors. The skepticism when it comes to mask effectiveness is due to the flip-flop actions we saw from the experts. During the early reports of COVID-19, the experts like Dr. Fauci and Surgeon General Jerome Adams both said masks do not protect you against the coronavirus and people should not wear them. Right now in the United States, people should not be walking around with masks. You're sure of it, because people are listening really no. closely to this. Right now, people should not be walking. There's no reason to be walking around with a mask. When you're in the middle of an outbreak, wearing a mask might make people feel a little bit better, and it might even block a, a droplet, but it's not providing the perfect protection that people think that it is. And often, there are unintended consequences. People keep fiddling with the mask, and they keep touching their face. And can you get some schmutz sort of staying inside there? Of course, of course. Surgeon General Jerome Adams put out a tweet very early on in the pandemic. Quote, seriously, people, stop buying masks. They are not effective in preventing general public from catching coronavirus. But if healthcare providers can't get them to care for sick patients, it puts them and our communities at risk. End quote. Due to the inconsistency in reporting from the media and the so-called experts, it's important that we look at only the facts, the numbers. Thankfully, there's a number of studies on the lack of benefits from wearing a mask for COVID-19, and in fact shows that there are adverse effects from wearing a mask. One such study was published in mid-2022 titled Bacterial and Fungal Isolation from Face Masks Under the COVID-19 Pandemic. The study looked at 109 volunteers who regularly wore masks throughout their everyday lives. What was found is wearing masks promote fungal and bacterial colonies on the face underneath the masks. A longer mask usage significantly increase the fungal colony numbers, but not the bacterial colony numbers. In conclusion of the study, the researchers had this to say about wearing masks. Quote, we propose that immunocompromised people should avoid repeated use of masks to prevent microbial infection, end quote. Alternative treatments. On September 1st, 2021, Joe Rogan put out a video on Instagram stating that he contracted COVID-19. Hello, friends. So I got back from the road Saturday night, feeling very weary. I had a headache and I just felt just run down. And just to be cautious, I separated from my family, slept in a different part of the house. And throughout the night, I got fevers and sweats and I knew what was going on. So I got up in the morning, got tested, and it turns out I got COVID. Rogan followed the science quarantined himself from his family and canceled his coming comedy shows. After consulting with his doctor, they tried a variety of different treatments and medications, one of those being ivermectin. So we immediately threw the kitchen sink at it, all kinds of meds, monoclonal antibodies, uh, ivermectin, z uh prednisone, everything. Uh, and I also got an NAD drip and a vitamin drip, and I did that three days in a row. And so here we are on Wednesday, and I feel great. I really only had one bad day. Sunday sucked, but Monday was better. Tuesday felt better than Monday, and today I feel good. I actually feel pretty fucking good. For some strange reason, the mainstream media became infatuated with Rogan's COVID-19 treatment. They started demonizing ivermectin, saying that Rogan was taking horse dewormer. 
More breaking news this evening, Joe Rogan, an extremely popular podcaster, announced on social media today that he has COVID. Rogan has said young, healthy people don't need to get vaccinated. In his statement on social media, Rogan said he has taken several therapeutics to recover. Turns out I got COVID. So we immediately threw the kitchen sink at it. All kinds of meds, monoclonal antibodies, uh, ivermectin. One of those drugs he mentioned, ivermectin, is something more often used to deworm horses. Did you notice anything off on that CNN video? They clearly altered the colorization of Joe Rogan's Instagram video. Why would CNN shame Joe Rogan for taking a medication prescribed by his doctor for treatment Staying isolated, aka following the science, calling ivermectin horse dewormer when it also has been prescribed to millions of people over the years for a variety of illnesses and in fact won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2015 for treating river blindness in humans. Joe Rogan says he has taking, COVID. Taking livestock drug despite warnings. Yeah. Jamie had to pull this up. You want to huh? play it? Does she, does she this is your news network. I'm going to watch. Let's see. I'm going to watch. Rogan telling his 13 million Instagram followers that he was treated with several drugs, and he included ivermectin on the list, a drug used for livestock. The FDA and the CDC warn against using to treat COVID. Turns out I got COVID. Look, they put a so yellow filter on me too. Immediately threw the kitchen sink at it. All kinds <laughs> they did. of meds. Monoclonal you see the antibodies, original video versus uh, that? I look like shit there. Z-pack. Do you know that? I think you look good. Pause. Uh, Pause. It's enough. Prednisone. I don't That's think. enough, Jimmy. I don't but, think Aaron had glee. Oh uh, well, it's more Brian Stelter was the gleeful one. But the the point is, that's a lie. It can be used for humans. I, I get it. I, it totally... Not just could be used for humans is often used for humans along with all the other drugs I took all human drugs yes they know it's a human drug it's, it's a, it can it's right but and the, they lied the thing it's I, defamatory it, it, it is it is uh yeah they shouldn't have done that it's I get, defamatory right well I don't know if it's defamatory I bet it is I'm not a lawyer I'm not a lawyer it's but, a lie. In an Australian study done on ivermectin treatment for COVID-19, they found that the drug does in fact help fight the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Even the CDC spreads misinformation about ivermectin. Quote, you are not a horse. You are not a cow. Seriously, y'all, stop it. End quote. Hydroxychloroquine is another form of treatment that showed promising signs of effectiveness early on in the pandemic, along with Zithromax or z -Pak. Many patients say that hydroxychloroquine saved their lives when they had COVID. Doctors from around the world also say that hydroxychloroquine helped many of their patients. I want to start with a new study in France that is giving hope for some treatment. The president discussed it earlier in his White House briefing today. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about it, how it works, and what you know? Sure. Um, the study that you're, you're referring to was a study that was done with only 36 patients, all which were confirmed that had, had the COVID-19 virus. And they randomized, they uh, chose uh, in, in a blinded way to treat those patients with uh, a, a medicine called hydroxychloroquine. And they coupled it with a, an antibiotic that uh, is very, very, very uh, uh, pervasive, Azithromycin, you know it probably as a Z-Pak or, or Azithromax. Uh, and they found that when they used the, this combination on those that small subset of patients, that they sh had less viral shedding and, and improved more, more rapidly than those that they didn't use it on. President Trump was one of the loudest vocal supporters of hydroxychloroquine during the pandemic. And a lot of good things have come out about the hydroxy. A lot of good things have come out. You'd be surprised at how many people are taking it, especially the frontline workers before you catch it. The frontline workers, many, many are taking it. I happen to be taking it. I happen to be taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. I'm taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. Despite showing signs of success treating COVID-19, the WHO published a recommendation that hydroxychloroquine should not be used for treatment. Remdesivir. Remdesivir is the only medication that received FDA approval for COVID-19 treatment via the EUA on October 22nd, 2020, despite very lackluster data. October was a good month for Jillead Sciences, the giant manufacturer of antivirals headquartered in Foster City, California. On the 8th of October, the company inked an agreement to supply the European Union with its drug Remdesivir as a treatment for COVID-19. 
a deal potentially worth more than $1 billion. Two weeks later, on the 22nd of October, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, approved remdesivir for use against the pandemic coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, in the United States, the first drug to receive that status. The EU and U.S. decisions paved the way for Gilead's drug into two major markets, both with soaring COVID-19 cases. But both decisions baffled scientists who have closely watched the clinical trials of remdesivir unfold over the past six months and who have many questions about remdesivir's worth. At best, one large, well-designed study found remdesivir modestly reduced the time to recover from COVID-19 in hospitalized patients with severe illness. A few smaller studies found no impact of treatment on the disease whatsoever. Then, on October 15th, in this month's decidedly unfavorable news for Jaleed, the fourth and largest controlled study delivered what some to believe was a coup de gras. The WHO's solidarity trial showed that remdesivir does not reduce mortality or the time COVID-19 patients take to recover, end quote. So why did Big Pharma go all in on remdesivir when it didn't show very promising treatment results in the first place? Well, I'm sure you can already guess. It's about money. See, other medications that showed equal or even better results in treating COVID-19 are dirt cheap. Hydroxychloroquine is a generic medication that costs about $20 for the complete treatment of COVID-19. The cost of a full COVID-19 treatment of ivermectin is anywhere from 60 cents to $1.80. The cost for the full treatment of remdesivir is a whopping $3,120. Big Pharma knows best. In March 2020, then-HHS Secretary Alex Azar issued a declaration of the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, or PREP Act, to, quote, provide immunity to qualified individuals, end quote, regarding the COVID-19 vaccine, making it impossible to hold Big Pharma accountable for any injuries the COVID-19 vaccine may cause. Many doctors across the U.S. have been fired and publicly smeared for prescribing certain medications to treat their patients for COVID-19. The only way an EUA or PREP Act declaration is issued is if there is a state of emergency declared due to something like an outbreak or a pandemic. And the only way a state of emergency can be declared for, say, a pandemic is if there is no treatment available. Quote, the FDA can use its emergency use authorization, EUA, authority under Section 564 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to allow the use of unapproved medical products or unapproved uses of approved medical products to diagnose, treat, or prevent serious or life-threatening diseases when certain criteria are met, including that there are no adequate or approved and available alternatives, end quote. Despite them admitting there is no known treatment for COVID-19 and giving Big Pharma free reigns to do anything they want and complete immunity from any liability, doctors were fired for treating their patients with different medications that again, showed just as or even more promise in treating COVID-19. One of the biggest issues with COVID-19 treatments is the inconsistency in studies. For every one study that says hydroxychloroquine is ineffective, you'll find one that says the opposite. And of course, the mainstream media gets its marching orders from Big Pharma. So it's no surprise that the cheap medications like hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin are completely smeared by the MSM. Recap. Before I get into the COVID-19 vaccine itself, let's take a moment to quickly recap some of what we went over so far. We went over the early days of the pandemic and how the mainstream media fanned the flames of fear. I presented the facts that proved the pandemic was not from a natural zoonotic event. We've established that Dr. Fauci was aware of -of gain-of-function research and lied about it to Congress. I've disproven the argument of there's no way our government would produce a vaccine without going through the proper safety protocols and how Big Pharma had a clear motive to profit off the pandemic. Now let's get into the adverse effects of the COVID-19 vaccine. Myocarditis. A study published by the European Society of Cardiology in early 2023 revealed terrifying data on vaccine-associated myocarditis. A group of 707 employees with a medium age of 37 of University Hospital of Basel in Switzerland were monitored after receiving a mRNA COVID-19 booster. 
On day three of the study, by measuring the patient's troponin levels, they found that one in 35 patients had developed vaccine-associated myocarditis. Hospital employees scheduled to undergo mRNA booster vaccination were assessed for mRNA vaccination-associated myocardial injury, defined as acute dynamic increase in high-sensitivity cardiac troponin concentration above the sex-specific upper limit of normal on day 3, 48 to 96 hours after vaccination without evidence of an alternative cause, end quote. There are countless studies on vaccine-induced myocarditis. Despite that, the vaccine is still being pushed by top medical officials. However, Florida Surgeon General Dr. Joseph A. Latipo issued a highly controversial statement recommending that males aged 18 to 34 do not get the mRNA COVID vaccine. Quote, this analysis found that there is an 84% increase in the relative incidence of cardiac-related deaths among males 18 to 39 years old within 28 days following the mRNA vaccination. With a high level of global immunity to COVID-19, the benefit of vaccination is likely outweighed by this abnormally high risk of cardiac-related deaths among men in this age group. As such, the state surgeon general recommends against the males aged 18 to 39 from receiving the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. Those with pre-existing cardiac conditions, such as myocarditis and pericarditis, should take particular caution when making this decision." End quote. Despite having an education from Wake Forest and Harvard, the CDC quickly released a statement in response to Dr. Latipo calling his guidance misinformation and dangerous. Quote, they claim that the increase of VAERS reports of life-threatening conditions reported from Florida and elsewhere represents an increase of risk caused by the COVID-19 vaccine is incorrect, misleading, and could be harmful to the American public. The FDA approved and FDA authorized COVID-19 vaccines have met FDA's rigorous scientific and regulatory standards for safety and effectiveness, and these vaccines continue to be recommended for use by the CDC for all people six months of age and older." End quote. Dr. Latipo was mercilessly attacked by the mainstream media, proving once again that they want you to listen to the experts, but only if the experts pushes their narrative. What do the so-called experts have to say about the damage their vaccine is causing to people's hearts? When Pfizer doctors attended a hearing in the Australian Senate, they were pressed on vaccine-induced myocarditis. To say that their answers were disappointing is an understatement. Now, it's important to remember that these are doctors who are employed by the company that developed the COVID vaccine that has been injected into over 350 million Americans. In fact, does Pfizer understand why the vaccine causes myocarditis and pericarditis and can you explain the process why the vaccine causes myocarditis and pericarditis? Senator, uh, all medicines, all therapeutic products and vaccines have uh, benefits and have side effects as well. Looking at the totality of the evidence for Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine, uh, regulatory authorities, health authorities, experts globally, including in Australia within the Department of Health and the TGA, have maintained that the benefit risk ratio. That's not the question that I asked. I asked, can you explain why the vaccine causes myocarditis? Yes or no? Uh, Senator, the benefit risk ratio. Yes or no? So you clearly don't understand the pathway, do you? Because you can't explain it. But that's just Pfizer. What about the second leading COVID vaccine manufacturer, Moderna? Senator Rand Paul has been the loudest and most consistent truth seeker in the U.S. Senate regarding not just the COVID vaccine, but the virus in general. Senator Paul asked Moderna CEO Stefan Bonsell if there's a higher incidence of myocarditis in Moderna vaccinated males from 16 to 24. Is there a higher interest or a higher incidence of myocarditis among adolescent males 16 to 24 after taking your vaccine? So thank you for the question, Senator. First, let me say we care deeply about safety and we're working closely to, with the CDC and the FDA to Pretty get... much a yes or no. Is there a higher incidence of myocarditis among boys 16 to 24 after they take your vaccine? The data have shown actually, I've seen, sorry, from the CDC actually shown that there's less myocarditis for people who get the vaccine versus who get COVID infection. 
you're, you're saying that for ages 16 to 24 among males who take the COVID vaccine, their risk of myocarditis is less than people who get the disease. That is my understanding. Sir. That is not true. And I'd like to enter into the record six peer-reviewed papers from the Journal of Vaccine, the Annals of Medicine that say the complete opposite of what you say. I also spoke with your president just last week and he readily acknowledged in private that yes, there is an increased risk of myocarditis. The fact that you can't say it in public is quite disturbing. Yet again, for leaders in the pharmaceutical industry, these people seem to not have many answers or knowledge about their own problems product that, again, has been sold as safe and effective. Unfortunately, many of the vaccine-induced myocarditis goes unreported, and in most cases, it goes away. In that study I mentioned earlier, all of the 22 individuals who had elevated troponin levels had no serious heart damage after 30 days. So what's the big deal, right? If their heart heals after a short period of time, no harm done. Here's the real problem. Dr. Fauci and the CDC recommend that everyone gets a COVID-19 booster shot at least once a year, the same as the influenza vaccine. It is becoming increasingly clear that looking forward with the COVID-19 pandemic, in the absence of a dramatically different variant, we likely are moving towards a path with a vaccination cadence similar to that of the annual influenza vaccine. Some even go as far as to recommend it every six months for some. That means regardless if the heart muscles heal, that amount of consistent damage to the heart is extremely dangerous. The athletes. One of the most alarming issues is the huge spike in heart-related injuries and even deaths to athletes across the world. Over the past few years, since the rollout of the vaccine, every week we see more and more athletes literally dropping dead on the field. GoodScienceing.com has kept track of every athlete that has had heart-related injuries or died from heart failure since the rollout of the COVID jab. They've compiled a huge list of athletes who have suffered cardiac arrest. One talking point you'll always here is that we don't know if the cardiac related issues in athletes are related to the COVID vaccine and there's no way to know that these athletes are even vaccinated. Big Tech quickly labels any post talking about athletes and vaccine induced myocarditis as misinformation. But let's take a deeper look into the facts so we can come up with a reasonable conclusion. Giants tied in Tommy Sweeney. Quote, New York Giants tight end Tommy Sweeney was carted off the practice field on Wednesday after receiving significant medical attention. It's unclear exactly what happened to Sweeney, but Dan Duggan of The Athletic and ESPN's Jordan Rannan described the scene as, quote, scary. Scary scene at the Giants practice earlier with tight end Tommy Sweeney down on the field for several minutes and being worked on by multiple medical personnel. Sweeney eventually left in a cart sitting up with his shirt off, end quote. 94% of NFL players are vaccinated. Tyson Downs, Waterloo Siskins. Quote, on July 23rd, 18-year-old Tyson Downs passed away unexpectedly and the cause of death remains undetermined at this time. The KW Siskins defense man died unexpectedly at his family's home in Owen Sound. Quote, we don't even know why. The doctors don't even know why. We just got cheated, end quote. All players in the Greater Ontario Junior Hockey League have to be vaccinated. Bronny James, USC Trojans. Quote, Bronny, the son of NBA superstar LeBron, was rushed to hospital following cardiac arrest during the training session at USC's Gallon Center on Monday morning, his family confirmed today. A spokesman for the James family said, quote, yesterday while practicing, Bronny James suffered a cardiac arrest. Medical staff was able to treat Bronny and take him to the hospital. He is now in stable condition and no longer in ICU. This incident is the second time the USC medical staff has responded to a basketball player with cardiac arrest during practice. Last summer, Vince Ewachuku collapsed at practice and was revived by USC athletic trainers. He returned to play basketball six months later. USC required vaccines for all students and staff. Damar Hamlin, Buffalo Bills. One story that brought much attention to this issue was Buffalo Bills safety Damar Hamlin suddenly collapsing during a primetime NFL game. To midfield and lowers the shoulder for 13. This is where Joe Burrow is so good. And now another Bills player is down. 
tell exactly who that is. Maybe Hamlin. Welcome back to Cincinnati, where medical personnel have been working on Bill safety, DeMar Hamlin, for the last nine minutes. Hamlin made a hit. He got up, took a couple of steps, and then just fell to the ground. We don't know, of course, the extent of his injuries, but the entire Bills team is out on the field right now. Several players are down on their knees. Other players are holding hands, praying. You can just see the worried looks uh, on their faces. As soon as we have more, uh, Joe, we'll pass it on up to you guys in the booth. This story really scared a lot of people. People that normally weren't much of a conspiracy theorist were starting to ask, what the hell is going on? Remember, the NFL doesn't require their players to be vaccinated for COVID-19. However, 94% of the players are vaccinated. When Hamlin made his miraculous recovery, he was asked by NFL Hall of Famer Michael Strahan. Strahan surprisingly asked the question we all wanted to know the answer to. How did doctors describe what happened to you? Um... Um, that's something I want to stay away from. What does that mean? You want to stay away from talking about the reason you literally dropped dead in the middle of an NFL game on primetime television? And the list goes on and on and on and on. This chapter of the documentary could literally be four hours long due to the amount of deaths and serious heart injuries in athletes we've seen from around the world. The real question is why? Why are all these athletes suddenly dropping dead and sometimes even on the field of play? This is a seriously startling epidemic, but what is making this happen? I spoke with InfoWars founder Alex Jones about this very topic in an exclusive interview. Well, I've interviewed Dr. Michael Gidon, the former chief science at Pfizer, Dr. Peter McCullough, one of the top most published scientists and heart experts out there. I've interviewed like 20 more at least, 20, 30 probably, uh, cardiologists about this. and. It turns out the better shape you're in and the younger, particularly males, who are just in amazing shape and blood really pumps through your body, when they get that shot, that spike protein really replicates. And then it creates artificial, like almost like ablation in the heart where they damage heart muscle when your heart's too strong. It does the opposite. It makes the heart too weak. And so when a person that uses 98% of their heart goes into explosive athleticism, they die. Cardiologist Dr. Peter McCullough has been at the forefront of this matter due to his experience. He spoke to Tucker Carlson on this very matter. As we've said multiple times, and it's worth saying because it's a sign of respect for the man tonight in the hospital, we don't know exactly why DeMar Hamlin collapsed last night. But at the same time, there are concerns about cases like this. Young athletes collapsing on the field of heart problems. And there has been a dramatic increase in this. You're not imagining it. So what is this? Cardiologist Peter McCullough and researcher Pangus Polycritus looked into this trend in Europe, European sports leagues. They found that prior to COVID and the COVID-19 vaccines, there were roughly 29 cardiac arrests in those European sports leagues per year. Since the vax campaign began, there have been more than 1,500 total cardiac arrests in those leagues. And two thirds of those were fatal. Dr. Peter McCullough is a cardiologist. He's also the author of Courage to Face COVID-19. He joins us tonight to assess. Doctor, thank you so much for coming on. So this is one of those phenomena that people who use social media are aware of because there are videos of it floating around. But I don't know when the last time I heard, if ever, an American public health authority address this directly and tell people, what is this? Is this real? Tell us your findings from your actual study on this. The concern here is that athletes at a professional level, Tucker, are carefully screened for underlying heart disease. The leading cause of sudden death on the playing field is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The athletes are screened for this. Uh, there are rare conditions, genetic abnormalities in heart rhythm uh, that can present. Uh, but sudden cardiac death should be a very unusual phenomenon. And as your report indicates, it's extremely unusual in the NFL since the high level of scrutiny. And the concern based on our research is that COVID-19 can cause myocarditis or heart damage. The heart damage in some cases can be asymptomatic and the initial presentation can be a cardiac arrest. There's other things in the differential, genetic abnormalities of heart rhythm disturbance, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, a spinal cord type of interaction with the heart. But I think the leading concern here 
is vaccine-induced myocarditis if indeed he's taken the vaccine. And boy, the family, the Bills doctors, and the current doctors at University of Cincinnati Medical Center have a public health obligation to tell us if he's taken the vaccine. The CDC, it seems to me, since the absolute numbers of heart incidents among young people are dramatically up across the West, and the CDC, as far as I know, has not been honest enough to address this. They sent out a tweet the other day saying, you know, you may be struggling with blood clots if you're a young athlete. I don't remember athletes struggling with young blood clots. It seems to me like they're trying to tell us this is normal. Is it normal for young athletes to have life-threatening blood clots? We should never have our agencies try to normalize side effects. The FDA says the vaccines cause myocarditis and heart damage. Autopsy studies show it can be and is fatal. The same is true for blood clots and neurologic damage. Our agencies should be protecting the health of Americans and safety yeah. is job one. I'm disappointed that they're minimizing it. But it doesn't just stop with the athletes. The medical tyranny expanded to referees, commentators, coaches, and beyond. So take this experimental shot where you can't play the game you love and devoted your entire life to. Hmm, that kind of sounds like medical tyranny to me. Blood clots. We've seen a rise in blood clots since the rollout of the COVID vaccine. Doctors, pathologists, and even embalmers across the country have sounded the alarm on the strange new style of blood clots since 2021. Richard Hirschman is a funeral director and embalmer who has shared some of these horrifying looking blood clots he's taken out of the bodies he's embalmed. Quote, I never claim to be a doctor or scientist. I'm an embalmer. I have been only sounding an alarm about what I'm seeing. I can only say that this is not normal. In the 20 years prior to 2021, I never seen anything like this. Something is causing this and I see it often, end quote. That tweet has been viewed over 9 million times. Many are thankful for Hirschman bringing this to light. However, some claim that the clots shown are fake or misleading. Hirschman doesn't shy away from responding to these callouts. One user claiming to be a nurse responded to the tweet and said he is misleading people. So how many bodies have you embalmed? I've done thousands, 22 years doing this. I spoke with several other embalmers and they have 30 to 50 years of experience and they've never seen anything like this either until 2021. We know what normal clotting looks like. We're not doctors, but we have seen more blood than most doctors, end quote. But Richard Hirschman isn't the only person talking about these clots. Del Bigtree is the host of The High Wire. Del visited pathologist Dr. Ryan Cole in a special edition of The High Wire to see firsthand what these vaccines are doing to blood. I got to the point where I was like, I'm sorry, I love everybody out there, but I'm gonna have to see this with my own eyes. And so I reached out to Dr. Ryan Cole, a pathologist who has proved to me that he's impeccable in the work that he does uh, unbiased and I said would you do me a favor can we get a hold of these vaccines and I want to come into the laboratory I don't want you doing it I want to be standing there I want to see it with my own eyes can we bring some cameras in and really do a real investigation because I want to know what the truth is so what we are about to do is break what we found in this investigation um, inside of Dr. Ryan Cole's laboratory. Let's get started, shall we? We saw Dell donating his blood and Dr. Cole directly putting all forms of the COVID vaccines onto Dell's blood and analyzing it under a microscope. Well, there's a lot that we did. Obviously, we looked at the vaccines under a microscope. We were looking at the clots and analyzing them and looking at slides of them. But what happens if you just put this vaccine right into a drop of blood? Well, we did that with my blood take a look at this you know this this discussion of blood clotting you've talked about it that the vaccines appear to be causing clotting on some level is there a way that i could test to see if vaccines cause blood clotting while we're here yeah it would be interesting to take some blood and put it on a couple of slides and then put a vaccine on each one see what kind of changes we could see all righty so here we go So here you can see I'm trying to put the same number of drops in the same part of each slide. And that way we can focus on that one part, part of the slide and it should be you know, uniformly spread. Look at that, holy cow. It changed immediately. Didn't it? Yep. Holy cow. Instantly cleared. I've never seen anything do that. 
And I don't mean to sound sensational, I just, right. I haven't. Never seen anything do that. Nope, never seen anything do that. Okay, so we'll first take the normal one. This is the regular without anything on it. Yep. And you can see little platelet clumps up in here throughout and then a couple of white cells in the background. So that looks pretty decent. All right, let's see what the Moderna looks like. So again, we'll start kind of out at that thicker edge first. And we'll work our way towards, should be the thinner portion of the prep. Question is, where'd all the cells go? Seriously. They're gone. <laughs> Seriously. I pushed them back into a big giant clump over at the edged clump. And again, is, is that the charge on the particles? I don't know. But where we put that drop, there are no red cells there. I was gonna say, as they come out, it's almost like they're you know, getting leather bleaching clear. Bleaching clear, some of them are folded and some are called, what do we call, crenulated, a little cr uh, crinkled. But yeah, I mean, that whole edge is like bleached. So this is the J&J. &J. That's totally different. Isn't it? It's like a nuclear bomb went off. Yeah, it's disordered, isn't it? And then there's a little more of that stacking, that rouleau here. And and again, look at all this clumping here out on the edge of it. Yeah. It just, yeah, like you said, like a nuclear bomb went off. It just congealed it. One of the topics Dr. Cole touches on in the special report is the way the vaccines were administered. Quote, good technique wasn't used. Aspiration of the plunger wasn't done, end quote. This is actually very interesting and it was without a doubt contributing to some of the adverse effects of the COVID vaccines. There was a study done in late 2021 that showed what happens when the COVID vaccine is injected directly into a vein, intravenous, instead of intermuscular, as it should be. Quote, we compared the clinical manifestations manifestations, histopathological changes, tissue mRNA expression, and serum levels of cytokine, chemokine, and troponin in bulb mice at different time points after intravenous IV or intramuscular IM vaccine injections with normal saline control, end quote. What was found in the mice that received the injection intravenous in the vein developed myopericarditis. This was determined by measuring the troponin in the blood. Conclusions. This study provided in vivo evidence that inadvertent intravenous injection of COVID-19 mRNA vaccines may induce myopericarditis. Brief withdrawal of the syringe plunger to exclude blood aspiration may be one possible way to reduce such risk, end quote. Natural immunity. When someone is infected with the SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, their immune system creates proteins that are called antibodies that fight off the infection. According to Dr. Fauci and the CDC, even if you recovered from COVID-19, you still need to be vaccinated. The reason they give is that the natural antibodies you get after your infection only last a few months. The WHO even changed the definition of herd immunity on their website to show that the only way to achieve this is through vaccination and not natural immunity through infection. Jeffrey Tucker, founder of Brownstone Institute, wrote a great piece on this exposing the change in August 2021. Jeffrey highlights a study published August 25th, 2021 that completely destroys the narrative that natural immunity is less effective than the vaccine. Quote, conclusions. This study demonstrates that natural immunity confers longer lasting and stronger protection against infection, symptomatic disease and hospitalizations caused by the Delta variant of the SARS-CoV-2 compared to two-dose vaccine-induced immunity. Individuals who were both previously infected with SARS-CoV-2 and given single dose of the vaccine gained additional protection against the Delta variant, end quote. Back to the Jeffrey Tucker piece. Now to the problem, the overselling of the vaccine and the depreciation of natural immunity. Who was responsible? Indeed, WHO was responsible. Let's have a look at their FAQ concerning herd immunity. The site was actually changed changed dramatically over the last 12 months, at one point even removing entirely the possibility that natural infection makes any contribution at all to herd immunity. The head of the WHO routinely pushed the idea that the new vaccines have created a great new way to be immune without ever being exposed to the virus. When you get such a virus and fight it off, your immune system encodes that information in a way that builds immunity to it. When it happens to enough people, and each case is different, so we can't 
can't put a clear number on it, especially given so many cross immunities. The virus loses its pandemic quality and becomes endemic, which is to say predictable and manageable. Each new generation incorporates that information through more exposure. This is what one would call virology immunology 101. It's what you read in every textbook. It's been taught in ninth grade cell biology for probably 80 years. Observing the operations of this evolutionary phenomenon is pretty wonderful because it increases one's respect for the way in which human biology has adapted to the presence of pathogens without absolutely freaking out. One day, the strange institution called the World Health Organization, once glorious because it's mainly responsible for the eradication of smallpox, suddenly decided to delete everything I just wrote from cell biology basics. It literally changed the science in a Soviet-like way. It removed with the delete key any mention of natural immunities from its website. It took the additional step of actually mischaracterizing the structure and functioning of vaccines. So what did the World Health Organization say before the COVID-19 vaccine? Quote, herd immunity is the indirect protection from an infectious disease that happens when a population is immune either from vaccination or immunity developed through previous infection. This means that even people who haven't been infected or in whom an infection hasn't triggered an immune response, they are protected because people around them who are immune can act as buffers between them and an infected person. The threshold for establishing herd immunity for COVID-19 is not yet clear, end quote. That's accurate overall. Even the statement that the threshold is not yet clear is correct. There are cross immunities to COVID from other coronaviruses, and there is a T cell memory that contributes to natural immunity. Let's take a look at what the WHO changed it to. Quote, herd immunity, also known as population immunity, is a concept used for vaccination in which a population can be protected from a certain virus if a threshold of vaccination is reached. Herd immunity is achieved by protecting people from a virus, not by exposing them to it. Vaccines train our immune systems to develop antibodies, just as might happen when we are exposed to a disease, but crucially, vaccines work without making us sick. Vaccinated people are protected from getting the disease in question. As more people in the community get vaccinated, fewer people remain vulnerable, and there is less possibility for passing the pathogen on from person to person. Lowering the possibility for a pathogen to circulate in the community protects those who cannot be vaccinated due to other serious health conditions from the disease targeted by the vaccine. This is called herd immunity, end quote. Notice that there is no mention of natural immunity, but wait, we just went over a study proving that natural immunity is more effective than the vaccine. Why would the WHO change the definition of herd immunity and spread such misinformation? Mr. Tucker put it perfectly, quote, I cannot say why exactly the WHO did this backflipping on basic scientific facts. Given the events of the last two years, however, it is reasonable to assume that politics were at play. Since the beginning of the pandemic, those who have been pushing lockdowns, hysteria, and vaccine mandates have restricted the idea of natural herd immunity, insisting that we must live in lockdown fear, masked up in isolation, until we can all get vaccinated. Now that the vaccines have not worked to provide protection against variants, infections, or transmission, there's a desperate scramble taking place to rescue the effort with endless boosters and continued masking and fear. The science has not changed, only the politics have, and that is precisely why it is so dangerous and deadly to subject virus management to the forces of politics. Eventually, the science too bends to the duplicitous character of the political industry, end quote. Let's go back to the claim that COVID-19 antibodies are very short-lived, causing natural immunity to be less effective than the vaccine. One study published on Nature.com in late 2021 shows there is scientific data that suggests those who have been infected with COVID-19 may have antibodies forever. The study shows shows that those who previously suffered from mild symptoms of SARS-CoV-2 in early stage of COVID-19 have antibodies stored inside the body's bone marrow. Those antibodies could remain in the body for a lifetime. Kickbacks. So the question that remains is why are people like Dr. Fauci and other experts continuing to push the vaccine to people who have recovered from COVID-19? Could the answer be as simple as financial gain? Are these government institutions and experts like Dr. Fauci receiving kickbacks for pushing the vaccine? 
Adam Andrzejewski is the founder of OpenTheBooks.com, a watchdog type organization that is dedicated to keeping governmental agencies financially transparent. As a part of a federal lawsuit against the NIH, OpenTheBooks.com obtained thousands of pages of royalty payments to NIH members and scientists. Unfortunately, most of the documents were heavily redacted. We can only see a portion of the kickbacks members of the NIH received. Quote, last year, the National Institute of Health, Anthony Fauci's employer, doled out $30 billion of government grants to roughly 56,000 recipients. That largesse of taxpayer money buys a lot of favor and clout within the scientific research and healthcare industries. However, in our breaking investigation, we found hundreds of millions of dollars in payments also flow the other way. There are royalty payments from third-party payers, think pharmaceutical companies, back to the NIH and individual NIH scientists. We estimate that between fiscal years 2010 and 2020, more than $350 million in royalties were paid by third parties to the agency and NIH scientists who are credited as co-inventors, end quote. At the end of the day, the NIH is funded with our tax dollars. Therefore, there should be no cloak of secrecy around any aspect of what they're doing or earning. Quote, because those payments enrich the agency and its scientists, each and every royalty payment could be a potential conflict of interest and needs disclosure. Recently, our organization at OpenTheBooks.com forced NIH to disclose over 22,100 royalty payments, totaling nearly $134 million paid to the agency and nearly 1,700 NIH scientists. These payments occurred during the most recent available period, September 2009 to September 2014. The production is a result of our federal lawsuit versus NIH. The agency admits to holding 3,000 pages of line-by-line -line royalties since 2009. So far, they've produced only 1,200 pages. The next 1,800 pages of production will cover the period 2015 to 2020. Since the NIH documents are heavily redacted, we can only see how many payments each scientist received, and separately, the aggregated dollars per NIH agency. This is a gatekeeping at odds with the spirit and perhaps the letter of open records laws. We found agency leadership and top scientists at NIH receiving royalty payments. Well-known scientists receiving payments during a period include Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and the highest paid federal bureaucrat received 23 royalty payments. Fauci's 2021 taxpayer-funded salary was $456,000. Francis Collins. NIH director from 2009 to 2021 received 14 payments. Collins 2021 taxpayer funded salary was $203,000. Clifford Lane, Fauci's deputy at NIAID received 8 payments. Lane's 2021 taxpayer funded salary $325,000. Kickbacks, Bill Gates. Another face we saw far too much of during the pandemic was Bill Gates. Gates, the inventor of Microsoft, businessman, author, has zero medical training of any kind, yet he is seen as some sort of a vaccine expert by the mainstream media. I'm really not sure why the mainstream media holds Gates as such a high authority on pandemics and vaccines. But what I do know is why Gates inserted himself into the COVID-19 pandemic and pushed the vaccine. Money. Just months before Patient Zero in 2019, Bill Gates invested $55 million in biotech, the same company that developed the mRNA vaccine for COVID-19. That stock obviously skyrocketed once the pandemic reached its peak and the company developed the vaccine, netting Bill Gates most likely upwards of half a billion dollars in profit. Of course, there's nothing wrong with good old-fashioned entrepreneurialism, but that's not what this was. Bill Gates manipulated the public into getting the vaccine vaccine. Then, when there was no more for him to financially gain, he stepped off the COVID vaccine train. We also need to fix the three problems with vaccines. The current vaccines are not infection blocking. Uh, they're not broad. So when new variants come up, you lose protection. And they have very short duration, uh, particularly in the people who matter, which are old people. And every one of those things is, is fixable. So, are these so-called experts receiving kickbacks for pushing the vaccine? Well, we don't know. All we can do is make an assumption based on their actions and secrecy around their finances. Vaccine Effectiveness 
Now that we went over all of the side effects of the COVID-19 vaccine, let's take a look at the effectiveness of it. Is it even worth taking the vaccine and risking your health? At the end of the day, a vaccine is meant to protect your health, not cause a long list of adverse effects. One of the biggest studies on effectiveness was the Cleveland Clinic study. Over 51,000 employees were included in the study to evaluate the effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccine. The findings in that study were damning. Quote, among 51,011 employees, 20,689, 41%, had a previous documented episode of COVID-19, and 42,064, 83%, had received at least two doses of a COVID vaccine. COVID-19 occurred in 2,452, 5%, during the study. Risk of COVID-19 increased with the time since the most recent prior COVID-19 episode, and with the number of vaccine doses previously received, end quote. What was found in that study is that vaccination against COVID-19 increased the risk of being reinfected. Yes, you heard that correct. Quote, the risk of COVID-19 also varied by the number of COVID-19 vaccine doses previously received. The higher the number of vaccines previously received, the higher risk of contracting COVID-19. The association of increased risk of COVID-19 with higher numbers of prior vaccine doses in our study was unexpected. A simplistic explanation might be that those who received more doses were more likely to be individuals at higher risk of COVID-19. A small portion of individuals may have fit this description. However, the majority of subjects in this study were generally young individuals and were all eligible to have received at least three doses of vaccine by the study start date in which they had every opportunity to do so, end quote. Get vaccinated for others. Remember hearing that we should get vaccinated not only to protect ourselves, but to, quote, protect our community and loved ones, end quote. I got the vaccine, you got the vaccine, they got the vaccine, we got the vaccine. We can get back to normal, let me inform you, let's all get the vaccine. It's about community immunity. I'm talking unity for you and me. If Doc says it's good, then trust me, it's good. Now let's all get the vaccine. Well, it turns out that was also a complete lie. Pfizer CEO Albert Berla tweeted the following in April 2021, quote, excited to share that updated analysis from our phase three study with biotech also showed that our COVID-19 vaccine was 100% effective in preventing COVID-19 cases in South Africa, 100%, end quote. Janine Small, president of international markets for Pfizer, was called in front of the European Parliament's COVID-19 committee in 2022. One of the questions that was asked by Rob Roos, a member of the parliament, was if Pfizer even tested the vaccine before it was even released. Was the Pfizer COVID vaccine tested on stopping the transmission of the virus before it entered the market. Um, regarding the question around, um, did we know about stopping humanization before um, it entered the market? No. Just yet another lie told to us by Big Pharma just to get their needle in our arm. Lesson learned? With all the data piling up what seems like daily, you would think the so-called experts would not only admit that they made a mistake, but also stop pushing the COVID vaccine. At some point, the excuse of it was a stressful time, everyone was scrambling to find a fix to this deadly virus is no longer valid. If the virus was leaked from a lab, funded by our government's gain of function research, and they then rushed the vaccine for the same virus that later was determined to be unsafe and ineffective, any honest person would admit they got it wrong and try to fix the problem. Instead, aspects of our government continue to blatantly lie to our face that the virus came from a bat and the vaccine is completely safe and protects you. As if we don't have the capacity to do our own research and read the studies and the origin investigation findings for ourselves. Did they learn our lesson? I know you'll be shocked to hear this, but no, they absolutely did not. In fact, they just rolled out a new COVID vaccine, and what do you know, just in time for the 2024 election. Only 3% of Americans have gotten the new COVID-19 booster, which is a stinging indictment of this US FDA and the CDC director, Mandy Cohen. They're not doing a good job, and Americans know better than to participate in their annual 
COVID experiment. The CDC posted the following press release on September 12, 2023, titled, quote, CDC recommends updated COVID-19 vaccine for fall slash winter virus season, end quote. It states that, quote, CDC recommends everyone six months and older get an updated COVID-19 vaccine to protect against the potential serious outcomes of COVID-19 illness this fall and winter. Updated COVID-19 vaccines from Pfizer, BioTech, and Moderna will be available Available later this week, end quote. They still have the audacity to claim that the vaccine is the best way to protect yourself against COVID-19. Quote, vaccination remains the best protection against COVID-19 related hospitalization and death. Vaccination also reduces the chance of suffering the effects of long COVID, which can develop during or following acute infection and last for an extended duration. If you have not received the COVID-19 vaccine in the past two months, get an updated COVID-19 19 vaccine to protect yourself this fall and winter, end quote. I'd like to call to order this secret conclave of America's media empires. We are here to come up with the next phony baloney crisis to put Americans back where they belong in dark rooms glued to their televisions too terrified to skip the commercials. Well, I think... NBC, you are here to listen and not speak. I think we should go with a good old-fashioned public health scare. Uh, yeah. A new disease. No one's immune. It's like the summer of the shark, except instead of a shark, it's an epidemic. And instead of summer, it's all the time. That oh. is smoke. Now, I hate to be the guy who derails what everybody else loves. He loves being that guy. But, Janice, we do have standards. This can't be a made-up disease. The only moral thing to do is release a deadly virus into the general public. Not understanding the difference between right and wrong. Not respecting the feelings and emotions of others. Constant lying or deception. Being callous. Difficulty recognizing emotion. Manipulation. Arrogance. Violating the rights of others through dishonest actions. Impulsiveness. Risk taking. Difficulty appreciating the negative aspects of their behavior. Those are the common traits of a sociopath. I'd say most of our government fits those traits to a T. The founding fathers tried to ensure that our government didn't get overly powerful by ensuring checks and balances were in place, dividing the government into three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. But the Founding Fathers never imagined nor intended for there to be a fourth branch of governmental agencies full of unelected power-crazed bureaucrats. Agencies of the administrative state include the FBI, CIA, Department of Defense, the Department of Justice, the CDC, and the FDA. Those are some of the most powerful government organizations, yet not a single individual at any of them were elected. Dr. Fauci, for example, the man who was basically in charge of running running our lives during the pandemic, was head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases for almost 40 years. Until his lies and deceptions started to become uncovered, then he conveniently retired recently. One of the biggest signs of a sociopath is abuse of power. It's reasonable to assume that the longer a person is in a role of power, the more comfortable and more likely they are to abuse it. Quote, both sociopaths and psychopaths are commonly found at the head of corporations, governments, and in positions of great power. This may be no coincidence. Sociopaths have a tendency to be power hungry and may spend a lot of time and effort attaining positions where they can control, dominate, and have authority over others. Once they obtain power, they commonly misuse and abuse it in ways that are irresponsible, destructive, and harmful to others, end quote. I believe it's fair to say that most of our government are sociopaths. This would explain the constant lying, corruption, abuse of power, and lack of empathy. Even Donald Trump hasn't learned his lessons on the failures that the pandemic exposed. Former President Donald Trump also bears a huge portion of the blame for developing this dangerous vaccine. And for those who disagree, don't just take my word for it. Take it from President Trump directly. Trump says that it was him that pressured Big Pharma into rushing the production of the COVID vaccine. In terms of Big Pharma, which is a huge topic on the minds of, of mothers, especially you're seeing what's happening at these school board meetings. Where do you stand on these vaccine mandates? And obviously, I know that you are you are pro-vaccine. Obviously, you did everything you could to get this vaccine out. I know where you stand on the vaccine. It was one of the vaccine. greatest achievements. We did it in less than nine months. And to be able to do that. Yeah, but where, but now it's years. taken a twist, right? It's, it's gotten, now we went from, this is a good thing, and people should have this option to military men, you're going to have to resign yeah. because you're, you're not getting this vaccine. Where do you stand yeah. on that? Well, I stand on, forget about the mandates, people have to have their freedom, but yeah. at the same time, 
The vaccine is one of the greatest achievements of mankind. There were no vaccines, there were no anything. I came up with a vaccine, with three vaccines. All are very, very good. Came up with three of them in less than nine months. It was supposed to take five to 12 years. Because as you know, I got them done in nine months and it was supposed to take anywhere from five to 12 years. I broke their ass, okay? And you know who doesn't like me too much? The FDA. Trump still believes to this day that the COVID-19 vaccine is his greatest accomplishment as president. A recent poll taken of registered voters showed that a staggering 61% of Republicans polled regret getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Although President Trump constantly slammed Dr. Fauci throughout his time as president, he was the one who gave Dr. Fauci the power to play the music that we all danced to for years. The people who were the advocates for the lockdowns. They got what they wanted. They got their lockdowns. Uh, the lockdowns were implemented throughout most of the United States, with some few exceptions, like the people who I advised, okay, like Governor DeSantis of Florida. Did, he ended the lockdown very early. Uh, Governor Nome of South Dakota. Uh, most of the country implemented the lockdowns, and the judgment of the success of the pandemic management lies with the people who got what they wanted the lockdowners. So if you think that Dr. Fauci was right and did a good job, then you're saying that President Trump and Biden did, both did a good job. If you're saying that the Trump administration had a bad policy and killed people, then you're saying that Dr. Fauci and Dr. Birx advised a bad policy that killed people. There's no separation between what Trump said and did, what Trump administration did, and what the Fauci Burks policy was. Trump's role in the COVID-19 vaccine disaster cannot be ignored. Until he comes out and admits he made a mistake by giving Big Pharma virtually unlimited power and complete protection from liability, he doesn't deserve a pass. The why. The question that still remains is why? Was the lab leak a complete accident and the scramble to produce a vaccine was to try to cover it up? That would mean that they actually tried to make a safe vaccine and failed. After all the research I've done, I don't believe that this is the case. I wanna make it clear, the last bit of this documentary is opinion. But what you also need to understand is that my opinion is based on facts that I've gathered throughout my research. Everything is a conspiracy until it isn't. Alex Jones quite literally is the most censored man in America. Some who aren't listeners of the Alex Jones show would say he's a complete lunatic based off the out of context clips the mainstream media shows. But as a listener for over 10 years, I can honestly say most of his predictions are spot on. One of those predictions that were just that was a coming pandemic. This just confirms everything else we've already researched. A Rockefeller study envisions future dictatorship controlled by elite, millions being killed, mandatory quarantines, checkpoints, the end of the family, everything that's in the other documents. But uh, this dovetails with all the other Rockefeller Foundation documents about the GMO food to sterilize you and the forced vaccines. and. The hell we're already living in that's just gonna continue to intensify until we take our governments back from these eugenics madmen. I was able to ask Alex Jones in our exclusive interview why the virus was created and why did they make such a dangerous and deadly vaccine. Throughout our interview, Alex continued to blow my mind and some of the information that he was sharing. Alex talked about how Event 201, the SPARS drill and Operation Lockstep were basically a playbook on how they would use a global pandemic to seize control. Tell us about what Event 201 is and do you think that was a lead up, like a test run for the pandemic? Absolutely. Uh, the UN started telling us about 12 years ago that there'll be a disease X that'll be used to bring in planetary control, a world government, a UN treaty that takes over all your local medical care and that creates a medical worldwide ID, a vaccine passport that's used as the platform for a global social credit score, a central bank digital currency, a programmable digital uh, token ESG system. So at least 12 years ago, 2011, they began to talk about it. And the original document was Operation Lockstep by the Rockefeller Foundation in, uh, in association with a bunch of universities like John Hopkins, and they say, we'll use a novel virus to scare the public, lock things down, make them wear masks, make them distance uh, six feet, uh, and then we'll permanently train them out of this to live in a lockdown society in a controlled system. And so Operation Lockstep is 2011, then out of that is uh, the SPARS drill, 
Crimson Contagion, a bunch of other drills carried out by the UN in, in, with Western governments, building up to six, just three or four months before they released the virus at Wuhan, Event 201 drilling basically the exact same scenarios. In my opinion, the why comes down to two things, power and population control. And here's why. You may say to yourself, well, the government trying to gain more power isn't a surprise, but population control, that sounds a little far-fetched. Now stay with me because we're about to go down a rabbit hole and step away from vaccines for a moment. In order to paint the full picture of the mindset of the power-hungry experts, we have to look at their full arsenal of tactics they use to gain that power. We've already went over how Bill Gates fooled everyone into getting the vaccine for financial gain, but it actually gets even worse. During a 2010 TED talk discussing climate change, Bill Gates took it upon himself to push his depopulation agenda. First, we've got population. Now, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, healthcare, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. Now, I know what you're thinking. There's no way that he actually meant they're going to use vaccines to reduce population. But not only is that exactly what he said, but also what he's been pushing for years. Another topic Bill Gates has been obsessed with is GMO, genetically modified organisms in our food. GMO food has been found to lower fertility in both men and women. If you look at the sperm concentrations, when we last looked at them, which was samples collected in 2011, the sperm concentration in Western countries was 47 million per milliliter, down from 99 million per milliliter 39 years earlier. So that's a decline of more than 1% per year. And it would predict between 2011 and now, which is 10 years, that we would be now below 40 million per milliliter. But what does GMO in our food have to do with vaccines? Well, nothing. But it does show how Bill Gates in particular has a very clear agenda of depopulating the world. Gates has quietly become the largest farm owner in the United States. But again, why? Why is a technology mogul buying up all this farmland? Well, isn't it obvious? It's a clear power grab and a perfect way to push his GMO agenda. According to a Pew Research study, over half of Americans believe genetically modified organisms are worse for their health. So by Bill Gates buying up hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland, he dictates whether a large majority of the United States eats GMO foods. Quote, it has been estimated that upwards of 75% of processed foods on supermarket shelves from soda to soup, crackers to condiments contain genetically engineered ingredients, end quote. Pushing GMO that has been known to cause infertility and a vaccine that is causing mass Massive health complications and even death seems to be the perfect route to Gates' depopulation goal. Bill Gates didn't just learn about depopulation and eugenics randomly. His father, Bill Gates Sr., sat on the board of Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood was of course founded by Margaret Sanger, a known racist and advocate of complete depopulation of the black race. Throughout history, many powerful people have been advocates for depopulation. Ted Turner, the founder of CNN and other television and networks has also been a big proponent of depopulation, saying we need to get the population down to 2 billion people and limit families to only having one child. Mr. Turner, um, I was wondering if you think it's a good idea to reduce 90% of the population because we are being overpopulated by a lot of... 90%. 80? Prince Philip said 80, sir. I go with 85. I think 2 billion is about right. Right, me too. Thank One you. Child exactly. One child policy. The following quote from Prince Philip seems like something ripped straight out of a movie. Quote, in the event that I am reincarnated, I would like to return as a deadly virus in order to contribute something to solve overpopulation. End quote. In all honesty, I don't think we'll ever know the truth on why this happened. Even if whistleblowers come out exposing the why and the who, they would be censored, smeared by the media, and called liars. Thankfully, however, we do have some fellow truth seekers in our government, independent media, and medicine. Those individuals should be celebrated. 
No one involved in this scandal should get a pass. From the media using scare tactics, politician closing down cities, Big Pharma for creating this dangerous vaccine, all of them need to face consequences. Making a mistake during a stressful time is completely forgivable. However, not admitting to your mistakes when they have caused massive health issues is not. Closing monologue. I didn't want to make this documentary to be honest with you and this is the very first documentary I've ever made and to be honest this wasn't a topic I was thrilled to cover. I mean our government funded the research that caused the biggest pandemic in history but it's not only that they caused the outbreak and continue to lie to our faces. They then ignore all the safety protocols that it takes to make a vaccine, irresponsibly rush the production of that vaccine without even knowing the long-term effects, tell us it's completely safe and effective. Then when a trove of data and studies and firsthand accounts come out, they tell us, no, that's misinformation, and then shut us down and silence us. I truly love my country. And after all the research I've done for this film, it breaks my heart and shakes me to the core to know that our government did this to us. Part of me, even after all this, wants to believe that they're telling the truth. They made a safe and effective vaccine and they did not fund gain of function research, but yet this came from a bat, a zoonotic natural event. Then I remember all of the research and data and firsthand accounts and medical studies that I just showed you over the course of this documentary and I remember that's not the case. So I just wanna take this final minute here and just thank you so truly Truly, truly much for watching this documentary. When I say that I put my everything into this, I truly mean it. I mean, this took a lot of time, effort, and again, I did all of this by myself. So all the references used in this documentary, if you want to check them out yourself, go to thebigjabmovie.com. And again, thank you so much. God bless and stay safe.